going to be sharing a message concerning the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency of Scripture. And I would like to uh, share uh, something that I did, uh, discovered and uh, found out earlier this week. Uh, we're going to have a guest speaker uh, two weeks from today. And that guest speaker is a result of prayer. And that prayer was on my part. And it's an answer to my prayer, and I'm shouting, glory, hallelujah. There is power in, in prayer. And um, I was feeling as though I needed a break from, you know, my duties in the pulpit, and I needed to sit under someone else's teaching. And... Uh, I got a call from a, an individual who I had asked to come and preach at some point in the future, and they said they might be available in four or five months. And, and I, you know, was like, well, that'll be great, you know, when that happens. And got a call the morning after I prayed, and the Lord just really blessed. And I am so grateful uh, for, for his timing. And... Today we're going to be talking about the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, in two weeks, the message we'll be looking at, among other things, the sufficiency of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you join me in a word of prayer, please, as we ask God's blessing uh, upon this time. Father, I want to thank you for this morning and for the opportunity to look into your word, for the opportunity to consider the principle of the sufficiency of of Scripture. Father, we thank you that we don't have to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. We can have stability and security. We can have a firm foundation based upon the truth of your word. And Father, I, I pray that you will take this principle today and establish, establish it even more in our hearts. I pray that it might continue to be one of the hallmarks of this church. And Father, I pray that we could encourage other Christians to look at the Word of God even as we do. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Several weeks ago, I preached a message on sanctification and the second coming of Christ and then a week after that I preached on the day of the Lord and flowing out of the day of the Lord we have a number of one another commands here in the middle of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and last Sunday when I was preaching it was my intention to actually unpack verse 15 as, as, part of the, as part of the text and as part of the passage. But in preparing for last week's message, I recognized I wasn't going to have time to unpack verse 15 in light of the preceding context. And so I determined that I would do it this week. Well, I began preparing for this week, uh, thinking that I would do 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. And wouldn't you know it, I got to the middle of verse 13, and that's all I have time for. In light of what God has laid on my heart, in light of what uh, God has reminded uh, me once again regarding his word, uh, I'm going to be looking at only the first verse and a half of our sermon text today, and Lord willing, we'll be looking at verse 14 next week uh, as we conclude the book of 1 Thessalonians. So let's take a look at this principle of the sufficiency of Scripture, and we're going to begin by looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12, and the first half of verse 13. And I'm going to end up doing a springboard message. And I'm going to use this short passage in 1 Thessalonians 5 
in, in order to develop a, a broad overarching theme in the Word of God, and in particular in the New Testament, as it relates to the ministry of elders and shepherds in the local church. Now let's take a look at this verse and a half. We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Now, this is one of those passages, if you're a pastor, it's awkward and it's uh, potentially self-serving to unpack uh, a, a, a passage that contains the information that are in these two verses. And so I'm going to begin with this passage. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, in it, but I'm going to use it as the basis for what shepherds and elders ought to be doing and what the focus of their ministry should be. So the believers in Thessalonica were encouraged by Paul to appreciate their spiritual leaders and to esteem them very highly. Now, we're a church that's relatively young. We're, you know, we're 16 months old as a, as a Bible study in a church. And God has blessed immensely in that re relatively brief period of time. And as, as one of the leaders of the church, I can assure you that those of us who lead are, are overwhelmed by your encouragement, by your support, uh, by your generosity, and by your love. And we thank you for that. We are encouraged that you treat us the way that you do. And so, before I leave this, this passage, I, I want to say a heartfelt thanks uh, from John, uh, John, and myself. But I also want to emphasize a couple of words in this verse and a half. The first one is the word instruction, and then at the end, end of the passage there, the phrase, their work. These two concepts are related. Leaders in the local church are to be appreciated for their instruction and esteemed very highly for their work. And their work is centered in the instruction of the Word of God. That is God's plan. That is, is God's model for the church and for the leaders that the Spirit of God raises up within the body of Christ. Unfortunately today, we have a situation where there are many pastors, where there are many leaders within local churches who do not recognize the authority of the Word of God and who do not recognize the sufficiency of the Word of God. And so they bring man-made constructs to the table. And they make a futile effort to oversee and to shepherd the church of Jesus Christ utilizing man-made principles. And I want to make it very clear to you this morning, that is not according to the will of God. God wants his shepherds to instruct from his word. God wants his elders to rule according to the principles of the spirit of truth. And if we violate from that, we cannot, we cannot pursue the will of God for this church. And so I want to emphasize once again Leaders should focus on instruction, and they should focus on their work. Well, what does the New Testament have to say about what their work is? Well, I'm going to take you uh, 
a long and express line journey, and we're going to look at some of the uh, highlights. Uh, we're going to take an overview of what the work of leaders in the church should be all about. It's certainly not every passage, but I trust that you will find this to be a, a, a fair representation of what the Word of God has to say on this critical issue. And we're going to start out in the book of Hebrews. In the last chapter, the author of Hebrews actually uh, makes two different comments. In verse 7, he says, Remember those who led you. Remember those who led you. Talking about leaders within the local church who spoke the word of God to you. Leaders in the church are to speak and proclaim and teach the word of God. That is their function. That is their call. And if they do anything else that prevents them from majoring on this central feature, then they are in error and outside the will of God. I can't state it any more clearly. And I don't know that I can state it with any more passion. I truly believe that we must, we must keep our focus in the Word of God. The author of Hebrews goes on to say, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So here's how it's supposed to work. The leaders of the church are, are supposed to teach the Word of God. Part of teaching the Word of God is to model the Word of God in their lives and give an example to the body, to the flock, to follow their lead. As they follow Christ, as they follow the Spirit of God, then the people within that local church can follow the example that they have set. And then the author writes in verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Now this is, this is a verse that sometimes can be used to abuse the flock by leaders who practice something that is uh, sometimes referred to as heavy shepherding. Abusive behavior, where instead of caring for and feeding and protecting the flock, they take advantage of the flock for their own personal agendas and their own personal ends. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. A true leader, a true shepherd, a true elder is concerned about the spiritual welfare of the flock of that local body of Christ. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Can I, can I tell you, it, it is a joy to be a pastor at Fellowship Bible Chapel. It is a delight to be one of the leaders of this flock. And I praise God for that. Acts chapter 6, we looked at this, uh, we looked at this passage uh, back last summer when we were preaching through the first half of, of the book of Acts. And this is the account where there are uh, two groups of widows in, in the church in Jerusalem in the days following the uh, day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was poured out and the Church of Jesus Christ was born. And there was a group of Hellenistic or Greek Jewish widows and a group of Hebrew or Jewish widows. And these two groups were being treated differently. The, the, the Hebrew widows were, were being fed. They were receiving the daily administration of food, but the Hellenistic or Greek widows were being ignored. And, you know, there was a controversy which arose, and, and, and so the apostles decided that they would address this issue. And we read in verse 2 and following, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, 
It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we, namely the apostles, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the focus of the apostles in the early church was, was the ministry of the word and prayer. It was prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, you'll, you'll recall that those seven men included Stephen as well as Philip, who played key strategic roles in the early days uh, of the church. Now, you might say, well, this is talking about the apostles. This is not talking about elders. It's not talking about um, bishops. It's not talking about shepherds. And I would grant that that is true. But I want you to recognize, first of all, that the apostles, their focus was on prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, I want you to take your Bibles, and I'm going to leave this slide up there, and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, where we find an amazing transition within the church of Jesus Christ. This transition takes place, it transpires before apostles of Jesus Christ passed from the scene. At our church, we believe that the apostles of Jesus Christ were personally selected by the risen Lord himself that the Apostle Paul was the last in time to be chosen as an apostle. And that when John, the apostle, finally died, there were no longer any apostles of Jesus Christ on this earth. The New Testament also uses this term apostle to refer to a, an apostle of a local church. And we, we look at those individuals and those people as itinerant uh, ministers or itinerant workers, and we sometimes use uh, the tag missionaries to describe them. But they are not apostles of Jesus Christ. They are apostles. Uh, they are authorized representatives of a local congregation. Okay, so we're looking at Acts chapter 15, and there is a problem that arises. Looking at verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you were circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Can you imagine the controversy that that would have caused? When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders. I want you to underline that phrase, apostles and elders in verse 2, concerning this issue. Look at verse 4. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. Then I want you to look at verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together to look into this matter. This was a theological controversy that threatened to cause division within the church of Jesus Christ. And this matter was looked into by not only the apostles, but also the elders. I also want you to look at uh, chapter 15 and verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And then look at verse 23. And they sent this letter by them, the apostles and the brethren who are elders, to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Now I'm not going to get into detail regarding regarding the controversy and how the apostles and elders settled that controversy. That's, you know, that's for another time and another study. What I want you to notice 
every time apostles are mentioned in Acts 15, elders are me mentioned along with them. Every single time. And then when you turn over to chapter 16 and verse 4, uh, Paul and Silas are on the second missionary journey, and they um, take Timothy, you know, with, with them. Look at verse 4. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders. Even before the apostles passed from the scene, elders were recognized as authority figures within the local congregations. That's clear from Acts chapter 15. And their focus was on the Word of God and the ministry of the gospel and how that was to be implemented. So, understanding that that focus shifted from apostles to elders in the first century, let's look at what the scriptures have to say about the role of elders within the body of Christ. First of all, from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, this is one of two passages that list the qualification for eldership. And just as an aside, I want you to understand and know that elders and bishops, or overseers, as it sometimes is translated, those are talking about the same office. Emphasizing slightly uh, the difference, uh, a different emphasis of that same office. So with elders, you have the Greek word presbyteros. We get our English word presbyterian, right? <coughs> With bishop or overseer, we have the Greek word episkopos. We get our English word episcopalian. Okay, their form of government is based upon those terms. So we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Able to teach. In this same book, Paul gives qualifications for deacons. And those qualifications for deacons are incredibly similar to the qualifications for elders, with one exception. Deacons do not have to be apt to teach. Now, they can be. You know, if a deacon can teach, I say praise God. Hallelujah. But they don't have to be able to teach. Elders, on the other hand, must have the ability to teach and instruct in the Word of God. And then we have uh, the second list of qualifications for eldership found in the New Testament. One was written to Timothy, the other was written to Titus. And this one to Titus gives us some additional information. For this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And then we read this in verse 9 relating to the elders. Holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching. So their, their ministry is going to be centered in the teaching of the word of God. So that he will be able to do two things. So that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. It's not enough that an elder teach sound doctrine. According to this passage, elders are instructed to refute false teachers, to refute false shepherds, to refute those who try to present error to the body of Christ. 
It's not only instruction of the word, but it's also refuting those who misuse and abuse and misinterpret God's word. Well, let's go on. Notice how many of these passages are from the pastoral epistles. Makes sense, doesn't it? The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. You're not considered ruling well unless you're working hard at preaching and teaching. How can anybody oversee effectively if their focus is not on the Word of God and what it teaches? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse, verse 20. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. That was Gnosticism in the early church. We have Gnosticism today, secret knowledge. Secret knowledge that unlocks the scriptures without which you cannot know and understand the Word of God. That's heresy. It's a false teaching. Paul had to deal with it in the book of Galatians. He dealt with it here in writing to Timothy in the first epistle which bears his name. Look at this passage from 2 Timothy, the last book that Paul ever wrote. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that I've, what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, or dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard the treasure. And you guard the treasure, Timothy, through the Holy Spirit that, it, that indwells us. And so there's this dramatic linkage between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Jesus made that linkage when he prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17, 17. He prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Earlier that night, he had identified the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth no fewer than three times. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And the Word of God is from the Spirit of God. And we're going we're gonna to see that in just a little bit. Some more passages from the pastoral epistles. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to face faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Able to teach. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, I know I'm beating this thing into the ground. But you know what? It needs to be beat into the ground. The vast majority of, of the professing church of Jesus Christ is not following this principle. They are using business practices. They are using man-made approaches to ministry. They are vainly attempting to reinvent the wheel that was invented by God himself. God says we do ministry by ministering the word. Amen? Amen? Accurately handling the word of truth. Again from 2 Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Prove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. You understand an evangelist is not someone who simply shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? You understand that. A biblical evangelist does do that, 
But that's not all they do. They also proclaim the word of God as they present the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the work of an evangelist. Their focus is on evangelism, but their ministry is proclaiming the word of God. And then in Titus, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Uh, that uh, word that's translated doctrine uh, is the Greek word uh, didaskalia. It's used 21 times in the New Testament. It's translated teaching, instruction, doctrine. Of the 21 times it's used in the New Testament, it's used 15 times. 15 times in the pastoral epistles, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. If you want to know what the responsibility of church leadership is, read those three books. It lays it out in dramatic fashion and in dramatic detail. Now, that brings me to my first point of this sermon. That was my introduction. <laughs> it was a lengthy introduction, was it not? But upon that introduction, I'm going to share with you three principles regarding the Word of God. But I wanted you to know and understand, I wanted you to, to, to recognize along with me that the Word of God calls the leadership of the local church to be totally, faithfully committed to the Word of God and to minister that word of God and, and, and that word alone. Not to add to it, not to bring other things alongside it, but preach the word, minister the word, share sound doctrine. So the first principle that I have in the message today is the source of scripture, the source of scripture. Very familiar passage, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So I want to focus on that first phrase, all scripture is inspired by God. The entire thing comes directly from God. Many of you already know, it's the Greek word theopneustos. The op nustas. And it can literally be translated God breathed. God breathed. It's a word that only appears here in the New Testament. It's only used one time, and it's used by Paul in this passage. All scripture comes directly from God Himself. He is the source. He is the source. Take a look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention. It's an admonition to believers to take the word of God seriously. It's an admonition for leaders in the church to take the word of God seriously. You do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Until the return of Jesus Christ. This is what guides us. This is what lights our way. This is what directs our path. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Here we're told that it's the Holy Spirit, it's the person of the Holy Spirit who is directly involved in the creation of God's Word. Utilizing human authorship, the the Holy Spirit of God directed and prompted these men what to put down on that parchment. Men moved 
by the Holy Spirit. It's the, the Greek verb pharaoh, and it can mean to move by bearing or to be conveyed, and sometimes it's used to picture a sailing vessel being propelled across the water by the wind. What an incredible picture of the Holy Spirit as the Word of God was being recorded. The source is God Himself, and in particular, the Spirit of God. Now, that brings me to my second name, main point, and that is the security of Scripture. The security of Scripture. And what I mean by this is when we recognize what the Scriptures have to say about itself and what it has to say about leaders within the church, people within the flock of Jesus Christ can be secure in God's Word. There's safety. There's safety in God's Word. Now, this is a passage that we've referred to quite often at our church. Acts 17.11. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Now, you need to understand the context in order to appreciate what Luke is recording in this verse because it's, it's really rather astonishing. In Acts chapter 17, you know, beginning in the verse, uh, in the first several verses, Luke describes Paul and Silas and Timothy planting a church in Thessalonica. Now, they were there for a relatively short period of time. Does anybody re recall how many Sabbaths that they were in Thessalonica? Three. Thank you, Bill. They were there for three Sabbaths, for three weeks. That's not very long, right? Well, within that three-week period of time, they planted the church, and Paul gave sufficient instruction that he was able to write 1 Thessalonians and remind them of what he had taught them during those three weeks. And we've been going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now, why did they leave? They left because of persecution, because the Jews in that city, who were rabbinic Jews, who were opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they denied the identity of, of, of Jesus as, as the Messiah, as the promised one, as the anointed one. And Paul and Silas and Timothy were, were driven out by persecution. So when we read chapter 17 and verse 11, now these, it's talking about the Jews in Berea. And that's where we get the phrase, we need, we need to be a Bereans, right? That's where we get that phrase. The Jews in Berean were more noble-minded than the Jews in Thessalonica. The Jews in Thessalonica rejected the message and persecuted the messengers. The Jews in Berea, they received the word with great eagerness, but they also examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. In other words, they didn't take the instructor's word for it. They checked it out in the source. And that's what we should be doing. Whether we're sitting under a Bible study teacher or under a pastor or under a missionary or under a special guest speaker, we need to examine the scriptures and we need to make sure that whoever's speaking is aligning correctly with what God's word says. That's what it means to be a Berean. And don't you see there's, there's great security in that approach? Great security. 
Well, this principle is also emphasized in the first five verses of 1 Peter 5, where Peter gives instruction to the elders. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. Notice that he doesn't claim the title of apostle as he writes this to the elders. He could have, but he chooses not to. He puts himself on exactly the same level that they're on. As your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Now, how does one shepherd the flock of God? There's two primary functions of a shepherd. Feed the flock and protect the flock. I mean, that's what, a, that's what an actual shepherd who has sheep does. And that is the dual primary roles of biblical shepherds, pastors. Pastor and shepherd, it's the same word in the New Testament. Feed the flock and protect the flock. Now, along with that, elders, along with shepherding, elders are also to exercise oversight. Remember that phrase, let the elders who rule well be considered a double honor there in 1 Timothy 5.17 that we looked at? That's the same concept, exercising oversight. Now, what's interesting about, uh, about this passage is that Peter actually gives uh, three separate contrasts as to, as to how elders are to approach the ministry. Did you notice them? Elders are to shepherd and exercise oversight. First of all, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to God's will. Second contrast. Not for sordid gain, not, not as hirelings, not for the money, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, with eagerness. And not lording it over as the Gentiles do, but proving to be examples. So what is Peter doing? Peter is calling the elders to rule in such a way as to reflect the fact that they are shepherds who care about their sheep. That's what he's doing. He goes on to say, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Does the all of you in verse five include elders? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Am I supposed to be humble toward everyone in this room? Yes. yes. The same principle is illustrated in um, the last several chapters of Ephesians where the entire body is commanded to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, right? And then Paul gives a series of three illustrations where certain individuals are to be subject to other individuals. Wives are to be subject to their husbands, children are to be subject to their parents, and slaves are to be subject to their masters. In, in, in our culture, we might say employees are to be subject to their employers. But the thing that is controlling those three separate relationships is the reality that everyone within the body of Christ is to be subject to everyone else. That's how it works. And that happens when Christ is at the head instead of a human being. Make sense? All right. That leads me to the title principle, the sufficiency of Scripture. 
Why is this so important? I'll tell you why. This is where the battle is being fought now. John and I have noticed in the last several years how much the Word of God has come under assault within the so-called evangelical church. It is being questioned for its sufficiency by leaders in the church of Jesus Christ. I don't care if it's purpose-driven. I don't care if it's emergent. I don't care if it's seeker-sensitive. I don't care if it's contemplative. All four of those groups have one thing in common, a commitment to mysticism because they don't believe that the Word of God and the Spirit of God are sufficient for the Christian life. That is wrong. By the way, it's my opinion, and some might say my humble opinion, that that comes from the pit of hell itself. The Word of God is sufficient. The Spirit of God is sufficient for the Christian life. To think otherwise is theological lunacy. I don't get it. These men who are walking down this path are deceived. And we all know who is ultimately the source of deception. So this is why it's important. Because think about it. Once you question the sufficiency of Scripture, once you lock that in as a guiding principle, God's Word is not enough. What happens to the authority of Scripture? It will crumble at the first test. If you deny the sufficiency of Scripture, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before you deny the authority of God's Word. So let's look at these two sufficiency passages. We've already looked at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 for the source of Scripture. Now let's look at it, look at it as a sufficiency passage. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That word profitable only occurs three times in the New Testament. Guess what? They're all in the pastoral epistles. Once in 1 Timothy, once here in 2 Timothy 3, and once in Titus 3. The Word of God is profitable for those four things spend a, an entire message just on those four words. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Those two terms are related. The word that's translated uh, adequate in, in my version is uh, the, the Greek word ardios, ardios. It means fitted or complete. And the word that's translated equipped is the Greek word ex artizo. Artios, ex artizo. So it's a compound verb form of the, same, of the same word. The Word of God is designed to do what God wants it to do. And guess what? As the master designer, it accomplishes God's will. And it is sufficient for every good work. It is sufficient. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is. The word of God which also performs its work in you who believe. That is a declaration of sufficiency from the Spirit of God regarding His Word to the church of Jesus Christ. My Word is sufficient. 
it will do what I have designed it to do. And when Christians accept this, not as the word of men, but the word of God, it brings great joy and encouragement to those who are ministering that word. The word of God is sufficient. And when it's combined with the ministry of the Spirit of God, that is the center of the bullseye of sanctification within the body of Christ. That is how we are being set apart. That is how we are being made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That is how we are being changed and transformed moment by moment, day by day. The Word of God combined with the, the leading and prompting and guiding of the Spirit of God in our lives. So, to summarize, God's Word is sufficient. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this message. And while it's filled with passages that are familiar, it's a principle that is critical in this day and age. Father, I pray that we would take this this message today seriously in our hearts. And I pray that we might continue to be the kind of church that has a high view of your word, that we might continue to be the kind of leaders that find the center of our ministry in your word and its proclamation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, would you please stand and sing with me page 382, the first and the last verse.